Hello friends. To begin our discussion on the great feast of Pentecost, let us turn to the Holy Spirit and pray. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy His consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, friends, on this Pentecost Sunday, our first reading is taken from the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. The response to Psalm, Psalm 104. The second reading, first read of the Corinthians, chapter 12, uh, verses 3 to 7, and then again 12 to 13. And then the Gospel is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. Friends, this Sunday, the church celebrate one of the great feasts of the liturgical year. You could call it, in a sense, the Feast of the Holy Spirit because it is the celebration of the gifts of the Spirit to the Apostles on the Feast of Pentecost. Some people even refer to this as the birthday of the Church. And so, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to look at the Feast of Pentecost and going to ask ourselves what is the meaning of Pentecost in the life of the mission of the church and how it is connected to the Jewish festival of Pentecost in the Old Testament and then also why does the church give us the gospel of Jesus breathing on the disciples and giving them the gifts of the Holy Spirit on this particular feast day. So, there are a number of questions revolving around that. So before I do, just a quick note and something to think about. If you look at the Old Testament calendar from the book of Leviticus chapter 23, the Jews had an annual cycle of festivals and the feasts just like we Catholics do. They had seven major feasts in the book of Leviticus. The, the festival of like Passover, first fruits, the feast of weeks, the feast of tabernacles, the day of atonement, and the, that kind of things. All right. So, what is interesting is that of those festivals, two of them have come over into the New Testament. One is Passover, which we celebrate at Easter. And if you recall, the word Easter in Latin is Pascha, that is simply Passover. And then the second, though, is Pentecost itself. Pentecost was a Jewish festival before it became a Christian festival. So obviously those two feasts come over into the new covenant because they are important. So we are going to look at that today in some detail and try to unpack this festival which sometimes gets overlooked by Christians. So we don't give it as much importance as it, is, as it really has. In the same way, the Holy Spirit sometimes gets overlooked by Christians as we ponder the mystery of the Trinity. It is kind of the forgotten member of the Holy Trinity in some circles and in some cases. So let us look here at the Gospel for today. The Church gives us the Gospel from the Gospel of John chapter 20 verses 19 to 23. One of the characteristics of the Easter season that we have seen over the last seven weeks is that the Church has been repeatedly choosing from St. John's Gospel. And in a sense, because 
Pentecost brings the Easter season to its climax. So she does that again one more time with John chapter 20 verses 19 to 23. So this is the story we have seen before. So it is the breathing on the disciples, the giving of the Holy Spirit to disciples. Although in this case, we are going to look at it from a slightly different angle. So here is what the gospel for today says. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now in some past uh, explanations in my presentation, we look at that very same passage as the foundation for the sacrament of reconciliation as Christ giving the apostles the power to forgive and retain sins. That is certainly an important part of this text. But that is not the primary reason the church chooses this passage for Pentecost Sunday. So today I will focus on those elements that are tied into the festival of Pentecost. So there are three key elements here I want to highlight. The first is the act of Jesus breathing on the disciples. In the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, the Hebrew word for spirit and the Greek word for spirit are also the same word as for breath. So in Hebrew, rua is the word for spirit or breath and in Greek the word pneuma from which we get the English word pneumatics uh, something that is uh, pneumatic like a pneumatic drill that is powered by air or by breath uh, so to speak or by a spirit in the sense that it has its own animating power so that word pneuma means spirit or breath. So when Jesus breathed on the disciples, that is very concrete way of expressing the gifts of the Spirit to them. So that is the first element, all right, here. And the second, Jesus explicitly says, in addition to that Spirit-centered act, he also says he, the words receive the Holy Spirit. The Greek there is Neuma Hagion. Hagios means holy in Greek. Neuma means the breath or spirit or wind. And what we see here is a fulfillment of something Jesus has promised earlier in the gospel. <clears throat> if you go back to John chapter 13, 14 and 15, that is the Last Supper discourse. One of the things Jesus does during the Last Supper is that he tells the disciples, I'm going to go away and then I'm going to come back again and then I'm going to give you the gifts of the Spirit, Neuma. So he also calls him the advocate or the paraclete. But that is actually an uh, alternate gospel reading for uh, today from John chapter 15. So what he says is that the Spirit is going to lead you into all truth. But I have to go away first because or before I can give you the Spirit. 
So one of the things the church is doing here by selecting this gospel passage is giving us the fulfillment, so to speak, of Jesus' promise to the disciples that he would give them the gifts of the Spirit after he underwent his passion, his death, and his resurrection. So he says here, receive the Holy Spirit. All right, so that is the second element here. And then the third element, and in some ways, this is the easiest to overlook. But as we are going to see in a minute, it is one of the most important is the element of mission. So notice, friend, when Jesus breathed on the disciples and gives them the gifts of the Holy Spirit, He's not simply giving them the power to forgive and retain sins. Although that is certainly primary and very much the focus. But notice what he also says to them, As the Father sent me, even so I send you. So in a real sense, Jesus is commissioning the disciples and through the power of the Holy Spirit, making them into apostles because apostoli, apostolos the greek word apostle literally means one whom is sent so someone sent is an apostle and in this case they are being sent with the same mission that christ had which was the mission that he received from the father and was empowered by the Spirit to accomplish in his public ministry all the way back to his baptism. He is now giving the Spirit to them in order to send them out to accomplish the same mission, the mission of bringing the good news to the world. And in this case, friend, I want to highlight the Catechism of the uh, Catholic Church. Paragraph uh, 730 actually brings out this element when it says about this passage for this week. It says, from this hour onward, meaning from the hour that Jesus breathed on the disciples, the mission of Christ and the Spirit comes, the mission of the church. And as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 730. Okay, friends. So, with that in mind, the reason, as we are going to see in a moment, that the Church picks this Gospel for Pentecost, the climax of the Easter season, is because Pentecost is all about the Apostles being anointed with the Spirit so that they can go out on mission, so that they can be sent out to proclaim the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, those are the elements of this gospel text that are important to highlight. Alright, now with all that in mind, let us turn back to the first reading for this week which is like the rest of the Easter season, taken from the Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. It is one of the most important passages in Acts. It is the dis description of the Feast of Pentecost itself and the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the Apostles. So although it is familiar, let us read it through together and we will highlight some key elements. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributed and resting on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak 
in other tongues as the scripture gave them utterance. Now there were dwellings in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were amazed and wondered, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So that is the reading for this Sunday. Now, there is so much could say about this, but friends, I will try to highlight what I think are the most important elements. Again, number one, Pentecost itself. That first verse, when the day of Pentecost had come, in order to understand everything that is happening right here, you have to know what that means. And just the word Pentecost. Well, friends, in a Greek word, it comes from the Greek word meaning 50th, as in the 50th day after Passover. So remember the feast of Passover was when Jews were, when Jesus was put to death, crucified and resurrected. So the Jews would count seven weeks from Passover. Seven multiplied by seven equal 49. And then add one day to that and on that 50th day, they would celebrate a great feast. Now in Greek, it is called Pentecost. In Hebrew in the, and in the Old Testament, it's called the Feast of Weeks or Shabbat in Hebrew because the Hebrew name focused on the seven weeks of the season that took place between Passover and Pentecost or between Passover and the Feast of the Weeks. Now, Pentecost or Weeks was a very important Jewish festival because it was one of the three festivals that was a pilgrim feast. In other words, adult Jews, males were obligated to the, by the law to go up to Jerusalem to the sanctuary in order to bring an offering to offer sacrifice on that day. So there were three festivals you had to travel to Jerusalem for. Passover, Pentecost, and then the Feast of the Tabernacle in the fall. So at that festival, Jews would celebrate the spring harvest. So just as Passover, the feast sheaf of grain would be cut down and offered in the temple on a day called First Fruits. Fifty days later, they would bring in the full harvest of that spring and they would celebrate that during the Feast of Pentecost. So this was a harvest festival. Indeed, it was a very joyful festival. You can imagine it is a springtime. So it is going to be beautiful in Judea, in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land. And that description of the festival is really laid out in the book of Leviticus chapter 23. It's a very interesting book, friends. Read Leviticus. So if you want to go look at the, look at for, for a kind of more detailed description of that festival sacrifice that would be offered to God, the first fruit, so to speak, of the spring harvest 
being brought to him in thanksgiving for providing for his people. So that is a kind of agricultural dimension of Pentecost that comes from the Old Testament. But there are another dimension to it also. The most of the Jewish feast had this. They would have an agricultural dimension, but they would also have a salvation historical dimension. In other words, they would also act as a memorial of some event from salvation history. So Passover was the memorial of the night of Passover when the Israelites were delivered from Pharaoh. So Pentecost in Jewish tradition became the memorial of arriving at Mount Sinai and receiving the law from God in the book, book of Exodus chapter 19 and 20. So for example, in one of the Jewish uh, tradition from the Babylonian Talmud, it says that Pentecost is the day on which the Torah was given to Israel, meaning the day on which the Ten Commandments were given to Israel when they were at Mount Sinai and Moses went up to the mountain and got the Decalogue, they got the Ten Commandments from God. So this was a very important feast in the his history of Israel. So now, what is interesting is, it is only in the light of that Jewish tradition that we can understand the second element of Luke's account and Acts, which is the Holy Spirit descending in tongues as fire. So this kind of strange you want to ask yourself, whenever the Holy Spirit appears and he takes the form, why does he take the form that he does? For example, put it in this way, why doesn't the Holy Spirit descend in the form of doves upon the apostles at Pentecost? Why is it tongues of fire? Now I think, my dear friends, most of us can kind of on a simple level think, well, it is because they began to speak in tongues and the Holy Spirit is like a flame, a fire equipping them to do that. And that is true. But from a Jewish perspective, there are more going on there that is actually tied to the festival of weeks. Because if you go back to the book of Exodus chapter 19 and you actually look at the biblical account of when Moses received the law, you are going to notice something significant, a parallel. So let us go back there and for just a second in Exodus chapter 19 verses 16 to 18 because this is a description of them receiving the law at Mount Sinai. For example, this is a scripture that would have been read in the synagogue on the Jewish festival of weeks. Just to give you an example, this is what it says. On the morning of the third day, where they were, where, where, sorry, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they looked their stand at the foot of the mountain, and Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Then it goes on to narrate how out of that fire God speak and Moses goes and receive the law. He received the Ten Commandments. He received the Torah, the Decalogue. So now notice the parallel here. In the Old Testament account of Mount Sinai, the Lord descends upon Israelites, which are the twelve tribes in fire. In the New Covenant, account of Pentecost in Acts, the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles 
and the first Christians in tongues of fire. So what we have here in every way is really a new giving of the law. It is the new Mount Sinai in essence. So that is what Pentecost is from an ancient Jewish perspective. So whereas in the Old Testament, God came down on the mountain in fire. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit come down in fire, which by the way tells us that not only is the Father God, not only is Jesus God, but it is also reveals the divinity of the Holy Spirit. That is, the Holy Spirit is the Lord. He is the same one who came down in fire in the Old Testament. Now, he is coming down upon the apostles in the New Testament. So, there we have revealed the divinity of the Holy Spirit. But also is going on here, though is whereas in the, the Old Testament, uh, they received the law in tablets of stones that were written with the finger of God. Now, the Holy Spirit comes down and indwells the apostles so that the law, the new law of the new covenant is going to be written on their hearts to be infused into them. They are going to receive that gift interiorly. And that is one of the major difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. It is the interiority of the new covenant. They are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit himself to keep the law and to proclaim the good news. So, what is happening here on Mount Sinai, that is Jerusalem, is a new Mount Sinai. It is the new Pentecost that is going to be ordered towards the new covenant and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So I think, friends, this is really fascinating because it is just goes to show that the idea that this is the birthday of the church is really a very appropriate way of describing what happens at Pentecost, especially when you think back to some of our early readings. We saw that in Acts 1, Luke says that there were 120 believers who had gathered together after the ascension and who were waiting for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is 120? It is 12 multiplied by 10. So, what we have there is a kind of new Israel. You had 12 tribes in the Old Testament. Now, that is coming to fulfill fulfillment in the church, which is going to be organized on the foundation of the 12 apostles. So, it is a new Sinai. It is a new Israel. It is a new Pentecost. So, it is the birthday of the church. All right. Now, the third and the final element I want to highlight here has to do with the speaking in tongues. Because that is one of the questions many people wanted to know or ask. The reason being is that if you look in the letters of St. Paul, especially in uh, first letter of the Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, Paul will talk about speaking in tongues. He used the Greek word glossolalia. Glossolalia. Glossa means tongue. Lalia is to speak. So, speaking in tongues is something St. Paul will talk about. And St. Paul, although this is debated also, seems to be referring to a kind of supernatural uh, speech. And undecipherable language that requires a gift of the Holy Spirit even to be able to interpret it and or able to understand. So now, if that is what 
St. Paul talking about, and again, that is debated, but let us consider that to be the ma uh, uh, majority interpretation for now, and it is, by the way. There is a difference between what Paul describes in 1 Corinthians and what St. Luke describing here in the Acts. Because in the context, what Luke appears to be describing here is not an indecipherable cause in context. What Luke appears to be desecrable here is not an indecipherable language, like a spiritual language, but rather a supernatural gift of being able to speak in other human languages and being heard as such so that the people or the gospel can be proclaimed to all nations. So you can actually see this if you look carefully at Acts chapter 2 verse 8. There when it says, if you go back to the reading, each of the people gathered said, how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And the Greek there is the idea. Dialecto. We get the word dialect from that. So they are each hearing them in their own dialect. They are hearing them in their own language even though they have been from all these different nations there. So what appears to be going on here is that the apostles have been given the gift of speaking in tongues, which is just the Greek word for another languages. It is a foreign tongues, means the foreign language, so that the good news can be proclaimed to all the nations of the world, so that appear to be what is going on here in Acts two, uh, chapter 2, which I mentioned this in previous discussions. But just as a side note, it's a kind of undoing of the Tower of Babel, in which humanity was divided uh, through the mul uh, multiplication of languages. So now the Holy Spirit is going to reunify humanity through the church. All right, so that is the first reading. Well, what about the responses psalm for today? In this case, it is from Psalm 104. Beautiful psalm. In Psalm 104, verse 30, this is one of the verses that I would like to highlight here for the day. It says this about God. It says, When thou sends forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the ground or the face of the earth. That expression there, dear friend, send forth your spirit, is the very same Hebrew word I was talking about earlier, ruah. It means spirit, it means the breath, and it means the wind, and all three of those. So that is the breath of God through which the whole world is created in Genesis chapter 1. It is the wind of God that goes across the face of the earth about how powerful wind can be. Those of us in Texas, even in East Texas, right, know full well from hurricanes that winds is very beautiful when it is a light breeze and a very dangerous when there is a hurricane. So it's a kind of expression that expresses the power of God and his sovereignty over creation. And of course, the Spirit of God refers to the fact that God is not a material being. He is transcendent. He is above the material world. He is the author of creation. So all of that is expressed in this very beautiful image here of send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth, which is what is going to do in Acts chapter 2 through the church. The church will then 
in a sense, be blown by the Spirit to the four winds in order to double Pondia. I just realized that. Blown by Spirit to the four winds in order to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. All right, friend, with all that said, I would like to end with a couple of elements from the living tradition. There is a beautiful text from the Venerable Bede. Bede lived in the early Middle Ages. He was one of the last of the church fathers in the sense of the fathers of the first seven to eight centuries. So that is when they are usually dated to. All right, he was one of the great scripture commentators in the whole history of the church. And Bede, in his commentary on Acts, said this about the tongues of fire. Now the Holy Spirit appeared in fire and in tongues because all of those whom he fills, he makes simultaneously to burn and to speak, to burn because of him and to speak about him. And at the same time, he indicated that the Holy Church, when it had spread to the ends of the earth, was to speak in the language of all nations. So what St. Bede points to here is that before Pentecost, the apostles were afraid. After Pentecost, they are on fire. They are on the fire with the Holy Spirit. But they are not just on fire. They are on the fire to speak of Him. So the fact that He descends in, uh, in tongues as a fire points to the fact that He is going to animate their speech. He is going to give them the power to not to be afraid and to go out and boldly proclaim the gospel to every nation on earth to the ends of the earth, which brings me to my final point. That is not from the living tradition of the ancient church, but from the recent teaching of the catechism of the Catholic Church. One of the things that I love to talk about is the sacrament of confirmation. And if I had time, I can do a whole presentation just on how confirmation is tied to the Feast of Pentecost, but I want to highlight here, just in a summary way, that the church has to say about, what the church has to say about this. If you look at all the readings we have had for today, whether it is John chapter 20, when Jesus breathed on the disciples and sent them out on a mission, or whether it is Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit descends in tongues of fire and gives them the ability to proclaim all of the readings for today are focused on how the Holy Spirit gives us the power and the grace to be sent on mission, to go out and bear witness to Christ. And so, friend, it is interesting that the Catechism says it's precisely that power that grace that the apostles receive at Pentecost, which is the same grace that you receive in the sacrament of confirmation. So this is what the church teaches us. It is evident from its celebration that the effects of the sacrament of confirmation is the special outpouring of the Holy, Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. It gives us a special strength of the Holy Spirit to spread and defend the faith by word and action as true witnesses of Christ to confess the name of Christ boldly and never to be ashamed of the cross. Friends, I just bring that up in closing because in my experience, confirmation is one of those sacraments about which there is a lot of confusion. One theologian back in the 80s 
said that confirmation was a sacrament in search of a theology. In other words, we have the sacrament, but we don't theologically grab in its fullness what this sacrament means, what it's all about. And so I would just point us to the catechism here as giving us a very clear and profound understanding, which is that confirmation is the sacrament that perpetuates on, in us the grace of Pentecost. So, in a way, similar to the fact that through baptism, we are incorporated into Jesus' Paschal mystery, the Passover mystery of his passion, death, and resurrection. When we were baptized, we die with Christ, we enter into his Passover mystery. So, in confirmation, we enter into the Pentecost mystery, the mystery of the Holy Spirit being poured out on the church and the church being sent into mission into all the world. So, baptism and confirmation are parts of one whole. Just like Passover and Pentecost were parts of one whole in Judaism. Passover was the beginning of the harvest festival and Pentecost was the climax of the harvest festival and in the case of the church, baptism initiates us into Jesus' Passover. Confirmation fulfills that and then sends us out on mission to the world. So friends, it's really a sacrament of evangelization. If you look throughout the centuries, that is one of the reasons why it was a traditional in the Latin West for bishops to celebrate the sacrament of confirmation on the Feast of Pentecost. In other words, we would be confirmed on Pentecost as a way of remembering that connection with the grace of the Holy Spirit that the apostle received on their first Pentecost. So I just bring that up as something to ponder and pray about as we try to live out the fruit of this Easter season. We have been journeying for seven weeks now up to this day and this great feast of the Holy Spirit. So let us not forget now that this season has come to an end and it really is just the beginning. It is the Holy Spirit now being given to us so that we can go out and share the gospel every day as part of our ordinary life as Christians and as witness to Christ. Therefore, friends, let us celebrate the birthday of the church filled with the power of the Holy Spirit always long to go on mission to proclaim Jesus is the way, the truth and life. May the trine God bless you, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. See you on Sunday. God loves you all.